cave dwellers found living in the Philippine rainforest. But was this story just too good to be true? I am absolutely convinced that it was a hoax. And I'm convinced because I believe them. I don't believe that that's a uh, hoax. 20 years after their discovery, the debate rages on. Can we unlock the mystery of the... It sounds like something out of a Jules Verne novel. That somewhere in a remote corner of the world, a lost tribe, untouched by time, still lives in the last tiny corner of Eden left on Earth. Imagine the excitement when 20 years ago, that tribe was discovered. The Tassadai, 26 men, women and children, living the life of Stone Age cavemen, unaware that there were any other human beings on the planet. Were the Tassadai really the people that time forgot? Or do these pictures tell the story of a hoax, one of the most elaborate in the history of science? The strange story of the Tassadai begins here in the Philippines, in the rainforest of the island of Mindanao. In the early 1970s, loggers were cutting down the rainforest at an ever-increasing pace. There were rumors of a strange group of forest dwellers living right in the loggers' path. And President Ferdinand Marcos' special assistant for national minorities, Manda Elizaldi, had gone to investigate. Elizaldi, one of the wealthiest young men in the Philippines, met the group first in June 1971. By 1972, through his private aid organization, Panamin, he was inviting the world in to see what he had found. The tribe called Elizaldi Diwata, God. Of all the tribes uh, we dealt with, perhaps the Tassadai touched me most. Although they never realized that we were helping them in any way. They didn't know there was a country, they didn't know there was a sea, they didn't know that their land had to be protected. Uh, the simplest things that we have. The tribe called Elizaldi Diwata, God. Of all the tribes uh, we dealt with, perhaps at the Sadai touched me most. Although they never realized that we were helping them in any way. They didn't know there was a country, they didn't know there was a sea. They didn't know that their land had to be protected. Uh, the simplest things that we had with our group, for instance, like rice, they did not even know uh, what it was or even have a name for it. The Tassadai live in caves. Elizaldi had learned of the tribe through a hunter named Defal who had discovered the Tassadai while out setting his traps one day in the 1960s. Defal brought the Tassadai knives, earrings, cloth, introduced them to new sources of food and to trapping. There was even a joke that Tassadai history could be divided into two periods, before and after Defal. The Philippine government stopped the logging and the scientific world savored the opportunity to study a living picture of our own human past. And I, and like a handful of other groups around the world, are hunter-gatherers. Because their lifestyle is so ancient, some scientists believe that hunter-gatherers may have a society and nature closer to that of our ancestors and might give us insights into our past. Were we, for instance, peaceful or aggressive? 
But all the hunter-gatherer groups we know of have long been in contact, however indirectly, with agriculturalists and the modern world. That's what made the Tasadai so fascinating. In their perfect isolation, they seem to present man in his pristine state. And they couldn't have come along at a better time, as anthropologist Alan Barnard explains. In the 1960s, I think the notion of the primitive hunter-gatherer was more important than it is to us today. Uh, perhaps it stems from the... The tribe lived as equals, and that it seemed that one Tasadai man needed to work only two hours a day to supply enough food for his family. For their peaceful and affectionate nature, the tribe became known as the gentle Tasadai. One month later, NBC News correspondent Jack Reynolds introduced the tribe to a national television audience. There are a few words in the Tisadai language that you should know because you'll be hearing them during the course of the program. The first word is chi, which means wow, oh boy, holy smokes. Chi. Chi. Oh. The second word is oh ho which is affirmative. It means that's right, that's correct, yes, sir. And the other word is kakai, which means friend. Oh, kakai lobo, kakai lolo. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> the other word is mafian, which means beautiful, good, all things nice. The image of the Tasadai was firmly fixed. But what were the scientists finding as they worked side by side with the press? In August of 1972, the Tasadai were visited by Douglas Yen, the world-renowned ethnobotanist. Yen spent a month with the Tasadai, studying their diet and their knowledge of forest plants. It was uh, one of the best uh, periods of field work that I ever had. I, I enjoyed it immensely. I. Professor Yen's work is to describe the unique ways that different cultures use and cultivate the plants around them. When all plant uses, medicine, food and products from rope to soap are taken into account, a distinct portrait of a culture emerges. Here, Yen demonstrates his method. Because people take their plants with them when they migrate, the skilled ethnobotanist can connect even far-flung communities through a study of plant use and diet. Yen's analysis of the Tasadai diet showed low levels of both protein and carbohydrates. Before Defal taught improved hunting skills, it was a distinct possibility that food gathering was not the easy game depicted in the news reports. Life in the Garden of Eden may have been tough. Next, people who were once part of the main farming community who had split off. In December 1972, Yen was joined at the case by Carol Maloney, one of three linguists to study the Tasadai. The Tasadai must have split off at some point from the Monobo farming community. The idea that the Tasadai had been lost in their caves for thousands of years now disappeared. Could their language suggest just how long ago they did become isolated? Some Tasadai words were unique, and there was a lack of terms for many of the everyday objects of Monobo life. The Tasadai accent, the tune of their speech, as the Monobo put it, was unusual. Maloney compared each Tasadai word with its Monobo equivalent, examining the pronunciation changes. 
these sound shifts can reveal a great deal about history. English has two words, chief and chef, which have been borrowed from the same French word. We know that the first one, chief, was borrowed before the 16th century, and the second one, chef, after the 16th century, because we know that French underwent a sound shift in the meantime, from the ch sound to the sh sound in that environment. Now, using that kind of knowledge, historical linguistics can show us when Tassadai split off from their Minobo neighbors and formed a language of their own. This initial linguistic analysis moved the Tassadai out of the Stone Age and into the Middle Ages. No more than 800 years ago, around the time Marco Polo set sail for the east, the Tassadai split off from the farming Minobos. Since that time, they had so little contact, they developed their own culture and way of speaking. The Tassadai weren't originally cavemen at all, it seemed, but they had become them. Further details might come from the anthropologists. But the late Robert Fox, the anthropologist who organized the research, was only able to meet the Tassadai three times, and never at the caves. And Elizalde, protective of the tribe, put science second. He placed limits on access to the Tassadai, and even tried to forbid certain questions that he thought touched on sensitive issues. Some scientists felt they were in danger. In June 1972, two anthropologists, who some say were troubled by what they were finding, were evacuated following gunshots into the camp by an unseen attacker who did not return. Meanwhile, there always seemed to be time for the press and their helicopters. The story of the Stone Age cavemen seemed too good to give up. There were quarrels with Elizalde. The story of the Stone Age cavemen seemed too good to give up. There were quarrels with Elizalde, complaints that publicity seemed to be his main concern. Film star turned photojournalist Gina Lola Brigida got in to see the Tassadai, but no full-scale, long-term anthropological study could be arranged. The Tassadai area had been declared a national preserve. Then, in 1974, the stream of visitors was stopped, and the press and the scientists were ordered out. There would be no further study of the gentle Tassadai. Twelve years later, in 1986, the Marcos regime collapsed. In the chaos that followed, a Swiss journalist, following a tip, slipped down to see the Tassadai. They lived in houses, they didn't live in caves. And they told me that uh, they were in fact not a separate tribe called Tassadai, but that they were from the local tribes Manubo and Tiboli. They told me that it was the idea of Elizalde to make them pose as cavemen and Stone Age people in order to become famous. This is Gintry with his uh, two wives and children and his uh, cloth. That's how I met him the first minute. An interesting thing happened one week later. A German magazine called Stern, they sent their own reporters there. They didn't know that I was there. I didn't know about them either. And the funny thing happened that the same man, King Tui, was presented to them as Stone Age cavemen. This time they have leaves, and you can see it's quite made quite silly. Some underwear underneath the leaves, you can see it through here. The Tassadai was a hoax orchestrated by Elizalde. The news was a sensation. See you.
2020. Tonight, Stone Age cavemen discovered in a Philippine forest in the early 70s. They shocked the world and changed history books. They were primitive, peat forest in the early 70s. They shocked the world and changed history books. They were primitive, peaceful, and phony. If this was a hoax, that's a heck of a story. The truth that could change history back. The truth behind the tribe that never was. ABC's producer for the Tassadai story was Judith Moses. We asked them how they knew when to go to the caves, and they said they were always warned. Uh, somebody from Manda Elizalde's group or from uh, somebody who worked for Panamin in the area would come around and warn them. The Tassadai told us that in exchange for posing naked and playing the Stone Age caveman routine, that they would be rewarded. We asked them, with what? What, what? what were you promised? They said that they were promised food, which is very important to them. They said they were promised clothing, and much to our astonishment, they were promised their own helicopter. <laughs> In the Philippines, rumors that had circulated for years were now openly discussed. The Tassadai hoax, it was charged, was part of a Marcos and Elizalde plot to strip tribal people of their lands. Elizalde had left the Philippines in 1983, followed by rumors he took $35 million in Panaman funds with him, and as many as 25 young tribal women. absolute lies. All of these accusations are absolute lies based on gossip, on rumors, and have no basis in fact. Manda Elizalde returned to the Philippines in 1987. He has built a replica of the Tassada rainforest on his estate. All these accusations are foundless. They are based on gossip, rumors, and deliberate lies. Now, why they did this is a rather complicated story, and I am ready to confront any of them and tell them why they're doing it. The loggers, cause-oriented groups who may have a political motivation, scientists who perhaps, like in a minor case like the Tassadai, were scared to go into the mountains where we lived, because I lived in the mountains with the tribes, and now try to make analysis and conjecture sitting in a plush office in Manila when we were sitting in leech-infested areas fighting together with the tribes against all comers. Elizalde, whose family is one of the richest in the Philippines, scoffs at the idea that he's exploited the tribe. For 17 years, I have been accused of having cordoned off the Tassadai Reservation. In order, 17 years, I have been accused of having cordoned off the Tassadai Reservation in order to take advantage of it for business reasons or whatever. 17 years have passed and I have still gotten nothing from this land whatsoever. Elizalde continues to champion the Tassadai. In 1988, he brought the tribe to Manila in hopes of proving their authenticity in court. The Tassadai seemed delighted to see their old friend again and to enjoy his hospitality and some of the pleasures of the modern world. Certainly, the tribe had been exposed to much that was new since 1972, and they had changed. But were they a hoax? There were 14 scientists who had seen the group in the early 70s, and none of them had ever said the Tassadai were a fraud. In the light of new evidence, would they change their minds? <laughs> I don't believe that us are a hoax. Uh, I have my opinions about the exploitation of, of their existence, but not, not that they're a hoax. Uh, there's nothing that anyone said that would make, it, make me believe that it's a hoax. I was quite skeptical about the Tassadai before I went there. 
that they might be Stone Age holdovers. Oh, come on. I thought that there were only 27 of them and that they lived in a forest only a three-hour walk from farms and fields. Uh, and furthermore, the association with uh, Elizalde, that Elizalde was you know, promoting the story or releasing the story, uh, made me quite suspicious. But after having gone there and having learned about their language and uh, the corroboration with other kinds of evidence about them made it clear to me that these are authentic, real, primitive people. But others in the field are not so sure. In 1988, at the World Congress of Anthropology, the original Tassadai researchers were criticized as what others in the field are not so sure. In 1988, at the World Congress of Anthropology, the original Tassadai researchers were criticized as romantics, in love with the idea of the noble savage. The Tassadai were produced. Elizalde uh, predefined it for the um, for the scientists that came in, as well as, as uh, for people that are less sophisticated. So that observers, both scholarly and journalistic, went in with an eBay fix as to what it was they're going to see. And they tended to see it. Imagine people living within a three-hour walk of agricultural villages that have been there for a long time and being totally unaware of, of them. Look at the pictures of the tools. You're anthropologists. Those are not stone tools like any people have ever made. And I think these are the only tip of the iceberg of the implausibilities. But I want to... Uh, Gerald Barman, an expert on ethics in anthropology, has launched an exhaustive attack on the early Tassadai accounts, both scientific and journalistic. The initial reports of the Tassadai are to me as an anthropologist implausible and beyond that they're preposterous in their implausibility. It was said that these people not only lived in caves, but they had left no remains whatsoever in those caves of the food they ate or the tools they had. Archaeologists know that this is an impossibility. As to the nature of their culture, it was said that they had no hunting technology of any kind, no fishing technology of any kind. They had to catch the fish by hand. The largest thing they had ever eaten that was a living, moving being was a frog. And no carrying or storing technology, such as baskets or uh, bags. Uh, people that are supposedly gathering wild food products have no way to carry it except in their hands. They had no rituals of any kind, nor any ritual specialists, or any religious specialists, no folklore. These are not only improbabilities, but impossibilities. There's no group of people in the last 40,000 years that's been without those kinds of cultural features. When you put these claims all together, they don't add up to an anthropologically believable account of a way of life of a so-called primitive people. It sounds more like what a junior high school class assigned to invent a primitive religion, a primitive way of life, might have put together. No insult to junior high school students, but it is not anthropologically believable. It's not authentic, and that's why we question it so seriously. Of life might have put together no insult to junior high school students, but it is not anthropologically believable. It's not authentic, and that's why we question it so seriously. Berriman believes that the Tassadai were the invention of Manda Elizalde, either for political and economic gain, or perhaps just for glory. The people in the leaf skirts were farmers who never lived in the caves. There was an intentional deception. There were people, I believe, who manipulated individuals or a group of individuals in the Philippines who were essentially farmers and subsistence farmers and got them to go into the forest to some caves dressed in leaves and play the role of cave people. Anybody here? 
Dr. Zeus Salazar of the University of the Philippines was the first to question the authenticity of the Tassadai almost as soon as they appeared in the early 1970s. On that genealogical At the 1988 meeting, Dr. Salazar cited dozens of inconsistencies in the early data. All of this can be checked by uh, going to the area. But how yeah, at the very outset, I uh, suspected that uh, there was something fishy with the story of the Tassadai. For one, I have reasons to believe that their tools are not real tools for the Paleolithic age. The uh, Tassadai tools do not have uh, shapes uh, which, uh, for instance, you would uh, f uh, find in... Uh, in this uh, Neolithic uh, tools, you would find the same shape hundreds of times in the archaeological excavations. Uh, specific forms for specific purposes, whereas the Tassadai tools would be of almost any shape. They just pick them up from the riverbed and tie them up uh, after them and you had the, the tool. The hafting itself is quite strange, quite haphazard and rather uh, loose, so that if you shook them with much vigor, the stones would all fall off. My suspicion is that they probably saw a lot of Hollywood movies before they set up this hoax. Not all the experts agree. At the University of Kent in England, archaeologist Ian Glover. Salazar has a point, of course, that the tool he illustrates and talks about is a very finely made Neolithic ads, uh, such as a piece like this. But of course, in reality, not all the tools used by any community were so beautiful, so finely finished. It's rather like expecting that the sort of uh, furniture and, and ceramics and glassware in our houses uh, is all like the sort of object you find in the Victorian Albert Museum. Uh, a piece like this, for instance, just looks like a broken pebble. We know it is a stone tool, probably used as a pick for breaking up the shellfish on the beach. Uh, similarly, we might find this is one from Australia. Or we might find a piece like this, uh, for instance, just looks like a broken pebble. We know it is a stone tool, probably used as a pick for breaking up the shellfish on the beach. Uh, similarly, we might find this is one from Australia. Or we might find a piece like this uh, from an early Neolithic site in Sumatra. It would be difficult for someone who wasn't a specialist, and indeed myself, if I found this in a situation other than an archaeological site where we know man was there building houses, leaving his food remains behind, we'd have some doubt that this really was a stone tool. But I think the context of it persuades us that it is. Our image of hafted stone tools normally fits something more like this. A hafted polished stone adds from Polynesia on a strong hardwood hafting lashed securely used for canoes and house building. But we do know that various peoples around the world have used stone tools, both polished ones and flaked ones, and hafted them in a way which seems to be very weak and very flimsy piece like this, which doesn't look really as if it would be very much use at all. Uh, it's a pounding tool, not a cutting one. Uh, it comes from, I think, from northeastern India. And one might wonder why they even bothered to haft a piece like this. It perhaps would be more effective just handheld as a pounder. But they found the hafting useful to give a bit of extra leverage to it, uh, and it served its purpose perfectly well. And this is a piece which is rather like those uh, we've seen from the Tassadai. And those tools, it seems, would be quite adequate for crushing nuts, for scraping rat iron and a certain number of tasks like this. They weren't used for very heavy-duty tasks. But from everything that we know about the Tassadai, they were not during the forest, building houses, hollowing out canoes and so on. No, the mere fact that the Tassadai tools seem to be so simply made and so crude and so irregular by itself doesn't convince me that they are a fake. We have to take into consideration the other sort of evidence. One problem in assessing the other tool evidence is that there's so little of it. The Tassadai explained that once Tafal had given them knives, they abandoned their stone tools. But where did the stone tools go? If they had been using them for hundreds of years, wouldn't there be at least a few left lying around? None were reported found. 
But what about the language? The linguistic studies had led to the conclusion that the Tassadai had been isolated for as much as 800 years. Unlike their neighbors, the Tassadai lacked foreign words in their language that would have indicated more recent contact with other cultures. Or did they? They possess uh, the word uh, Diwat. Or did they? They possess uh, the word uh, Diwata, which is a Sanskrit term for God, divinity. This uh, word uh, could not have entered the Philippines earlier than the 14th century. I did, in my publication of the 70s, point out that Tassada I have the term Diwata, which means deity or honorific. They use it in only one context, and that is to refer to Manda Elizalde. They don't use it in the context you would expect to use the term deity. Uh, that leads me to believe that it may be a recent loanword. And in fact, they say that they learned that term from the Fall to refer to Elizalde. Out of Maloney's 800 Tassadai words, Diwata was the only Sanskrit term. Six were Chinese-based, and none were from English or Spanish. By comparison, Tiboli and Manobo are inundated with traces of foreign words. Could the farmers playing dress-up have fooled Maloney by just avoiding foreign terms? That might have been difficult. Borrowed foreign words gradually get buried in a language, and they can be difficult to identify. How many English speakers do you suppose know that we find the term je, uh, sorry, the sound je, in English only in French um, borrowed words, azure, garage in English? that uh, every time there is a je sound, it's a marker that we have a French borrowed word. Very few English speakers know that. Now imagine that you would have the skills to first of all exclude them from your speech, and second of all to never lapse in excluding them. It's simply very implausible. But since Maloney did her study, the field of linguistics has refined the statistical method used to date separation. The new, more conservative method suggests that the Sadai separated from their Manobo neighbors as recently as 150 years ago. Critics discount the linguistic data, arguing that it describes only a slight difference in dialect, not separation. They say that the Sadai actors were drawn from these people, the Taboli. Certainly, the Taboli appear quite different. Their elaborate ceremonies and dress are a long way from life in the caves. And their character appears different as well. Here they are enjoying a favorite pastime, horse fighting. But the biggest difference is that the Tabolis and Monobos are farmers. But the biggest difference is that the Tabolis and Monobos are farmers. It would have been easy for them to hide their clothing and pastimes, but pretending to know no agriculture might have been a harder trick. Their songs and speech are full of words that describe what is familiar to them. For instance, they have literally hundreds of terms just for agriculture. Types of fields, types of soil, types of crops, like the rice and beans which are part of their regular diet. In fact, almost all their foods are cultivated. Here is the Tassadai diet, as reported to Doug Yen. No mention of cultivated foods at all. Were they simply lying? Again, Carol Maloney says that if they were, their words would have betrayed them. 
The hoax theorists are claiming that these are people from surrounding villages who are called away from their farms to go into masquerade as primitives in the forest and then to return to their fields. This implies that they would have to carefully exclude from their speech while they were speaking this Tassadai language all of these, this rich complex of agricultural terms, including the metaphors that you find in those surrounding languages. Just imagine yourself excluding from your own speech all of those agricultural metaphors. Uh, there isn't a grain of truth to that. Um, sowing the seeds of disruption. Uh, I'm going to plow that money back into the firm. Imagine the children sharing in this conspiracy that they would never slip and never use any of these terms either. It's simply very implausible. For Doug Yen, this stock from a rice plant was further evidence. I was very skeptical about the uh, isolation of the Tassadai, especially from their neighbors, the immediate neighbors, uh, who are slash and burn agriculturists. And so uh, there were opportunities, there were some opportunities to try, to try them out. One well, of the best was when I went to uh, Blit and got this. But when I went back, I was surrounded by two or three or four kids, and uh, so I just pulled this out of the pack. And I said, uh, what is this? My usual question, what is this? Their expressions were of absolute surprise. They didn't know what it was. They didn't associate it with the polished rice that they'd been given to eat, and which we'd been eating in the camp. They didn't uh, associate with anything. Uh, keep in mind of the children. Uh, this, this one couldn't have been faked. This surprise, this ignorance could not have been faked. Uh, so I... Uh, it's, it's not conclusive evidence of, for isolation, but gosh, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty persuasive, don't you think? What about the caves? Did the Tassadai really live in them? No archaeological dig has ever been attempted to test the claim. But there is this piece of circumstantial evidence. It's a film made in 1974 by the last of the original researchers, Professor Iranius Ibel Ibelsfeld. Eibel Eibelsfeld is an ethologist. He studies the minute detail ever been attempted to test the claim. But there is this piece of circumstantial evidence. It's a film made in 1974 by the last of the original researchers, Professor Iranius Eibel Eibelsfeld. Eibel Eibelsfeld is an ethologist. He studies the minute details of human behavior, sometimes resorting to the use of a specially mirrored camera so that his subjects are less aware they're being filmed. He is convinced that the Tassadai were authentic cave dwellers. He does not believe these children were just pretending. If they were, he says, they were very, very good actors. Access to the Tassadai is still limited to those with government approval. One group that did receive permission to visit the tribe came from the local Taboli mission. The fathers at the mission have been following the Tassadai story for over 20 years, and they've had their doubts, as Father Sean McDonough explains. It would be true to say that we at the Santa Cruz Mission thought that the Tassadai was a hoax, mainly because of its association with Mandel Izalde. Recently, the Tassadai invited us to go in to see how they lived, they lived in caves, and our people now believe what they say about themselves, that they are Tassadai, that they speak a different language, that they have a different way of life. And so we have changed our opinion, yes, in recent times. The Bali people would say in general, the, that the Tassadai are a separate people whom they did not know in the past, that they speak a, se a separate language, that they don't understand that separate language, and therefore they would say, 
for them. They are not a group of Tiboli people masquerading as Tassadai. That's basically what most of the Tibolis that I know have said in the last 18 months since they've begun to meet them. But if the Tibolis lived so close to the Tassadai caves, how could they have not known about their neighbors? The rainforest could have prevented contact. Once, most of Mindanao Island was covered in virgin rainforest. Farming communities kept well away from it. In the Tassadai area itself, the forest was intact until the 1950s. Then came a huge influx of loggers and immigrants, which pushed the forest back away from the coast. Logging and new settlement continued over the course of the next 10 years, bringing the outside world closer to the caves. If the Tassadai were isolated, the new settlements made their discovery inevitable. Today, the forest is almost gone, and access to the Tassadai area is easier than it has ever been. Still, the Tassadai story remains a perplexing one. Since Oswald Eaton, the Swiss journalist, the Tassadai area is easier than it has ever been. Still, the Tassadai story remains a perplexing one. Since Oswald Eaton, the Swiss journalist, first declared the Tassadai a hoax, the tribe has made a series of conflicting statements on television. They told NBC they were real. This is the first time many of the tribe have been inside a house. One said, what kind of cave is this? <laughs> And they told ABC they were fake. A news magazine, 2020. I am absolutely convinced that it was a hoax. And I'm convinced because I believe them. They've told Philippine television they were real. And British television, they were fake. What tribe do they say they belong to? We are not a separate tribe. We are a mixture of Tiboli and Manobo tribe. In Manila, there were Senate hearings on the Tassadai. For two years, a parade of witnesses testified. Many changed their story or recanted their testimony. One man was accused of impersonating a Tassadai woman in order to falsely claim a hoax. Another witness who claimed hoax was soon killed by police in disputed circumstances. The hearings concluded that Tassadai were authentic, but the judgment seemed to settle nothing. At the Summer Institute of Linguistics in Dallas, Texas, anthropologist Thomas Hedlund has been puzzling over the story of the Tassadai for the past three years. A veteran of more than 20 years fieldwork in the Philippines, Hedlund's been editing a book that brings together all the Tassadai arguments in one volume. With the book complete, he's now ready with his answer to the riddle of the Tassadai. Was it a hoax or not? Well, that's a question I'm asked all the time. And then people, most people give me about 17 seconds to answer that. It's complicated and it's hard to answer shortly, but I'll give it a try. If you mean, was it a hoax? Do you mean were these people paid performers, paid to go in from outside and pose in the rainforest as some kind of... Was it a hoax? Do you mean, were these people paid performers, paid to go in from outside and pose in the rainforest as some kind of primitive stony people? Then I'd say in that sense, it wasn't a hoax. Now, if you really, if you're asking me, were there exaggerations, were there untrue st stories told about the Tassadai? Then in that sense, it was a hoax. There were certainly gross exaggerations made about the Tassadai. And one thing that's important to remember is these exaggerations, these false reports, perhaps made unwittingly by j journalists, media people, and maybe even scientists that were excited about what they were finding, they exaggerated the stories. But you must remember there were also 
untrue, incorrect statements made in the 1980s, in my opinion, by people that were claiming that it was a hoax. Hedlund believes our understanding of the Tassadai has changed as our own ideas about hunter-gatherers have shifted. Well, throughout the first half of this century and into part of the second, the idea, certainly in the popular mind and even with anthropologists, was that hunter-gatherers lived a miserable existence, uh, barely able to find their daily food, and it's a wonder they ever survived and before they discovered agriculture. Then in 1968, there was a, a dramatic shift in, in anthropology uh, looking at hunter-gatherer societies, hunter-gatherer peoples, human foragers. It was decided, uh, based on some evidence, that these people actually lived a very uh, affluent lifestyle was the term they used. They had enough food. They were able to find plenty of wild foods without even having to work very many hours a week and were relatively uh, healthy people, too. This, pop this idea became very popular at the end of the 60s. Then two years when, uh, when this idea was at its height, this uh, affluent forager idea, the Desadi were discovered. Here was a group that fit the model perfectly. Uh, the Tassadai were described as extremely affluent people. National Geographic said that uh, the man on, a man only had to work about two hours a day to supply food for his family. Uh, that they were in very good health. They, they were so peaceful and leisure they didn't even have any word for war. And so they described these people as uh, more affluent than they were. I teach my students in my classes before they go to the field, my grad students about self-fulfilling the danger, self-fulfilling hypotheses. Don't go out and come back with the data you hope to come back with. Just let truth lead you wherever it will when you get to the field. Collect your data and bring it back and write it up. This wasn't done in this case. While the scientific argument continues, life for the Tassadai goes on. Some of the children of 1972 now have children of their own. And while they still don leaves for the occasional film crew that is granted access to their preserve, and while they still don leaves for the occasional film crew that is granted access to their preserve, they seem just as comfortable in Western dress. They have befriended their Monobo neighbors, and intermarriage has increased their number from 21 to 62. They are just beginning to learn agriculture from the Monobo, they say. A new beginning, they call it. And while the Tassadai past may be forever debated, it is possible to construct a kind of likely story that fits the scientific evidence. One plausible history of the Tassadai people. Okay, we know for a fact that they were originally a part of the Monobo farming community. There were lots of Monobo farmers all over Mindanao. For some reason, they broke off from the larger community. Maybe they were having a feud with their neighbors. Maybe they were fleeing from epidemic diseases. Or most likely, in my view, they were fleeing from slave raiders because slave raiding was just going on all over the southern Philippines in the latter half of the 19th century. We know that they broke off sometime in the 19th century based on linguistic data. In fact, there were people all over the Philippines that were hiding in the forest from slave raiders in those days. For some reason, this group stayed. <laughs> For the Tassadai, perhaps, what began as techniques necessary to survive with only a poor diet and crudely made stone tools slowly became a new way of life. As generations passed, memories of the outside world dimmed. Perhaps by 1971, the descendants really did believe they were the only human beings on the planet. More likely, like many other refuge groups we know about, the Tassadai had occasional contact with outsiders, gathering over the years bits and pieces of the modern world. Far from an idealized image of the remote past, the Tassadai may, in the end, present us with a darker picture of the tangled present. They adapted to an economic life of hunting and gathering and uh, foraging and, in my view, trading with their farmer neighbors downriver. Then, 1971, along comes Manuel Elizalde and his helicopter. Well, this changed Tassadai life forever. 
As the Tassadai enter their third decade of celebrity, it may seem that the end to the controversy about them... As the Tassadai enter their third decade of celebrity, it may seem that the end to the controversy about them is in sight. But the main combatants in this strange story remain unconvinced. The argument continues in the same impassioned tone it took on at the 1988 World Congress when journalist John Nance, who had popularized the Tassadai in the 1970s, found himself face to face with his detractors. See what you expect. This is the ugliest, the most disgusting, the most disgraceful story that I've ever been involved in. The reason why it took off is I think it was a combination of second rate science and fifth rate reporting. There are no authorities in, uh, in science. Even the, the greatest uh, authorities uh, are liable to be questioned about it. I mean, you keep yeah. saying those things and just 